Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to this very special episode of the Dr. GPCR podcast. I had the privilege to co-chair a panel discussion on GPCR research and AI at the last third earnest meeting on October 14th, 2020. I want to say thank you to the earnest meeting organizers for the invitation, with special thanks to Dr. Martha Summer, Dr. Alexander Hauser, and Louise Wagner. I would also like to thank our panelists from Interax Biotech, Dr. Maria Walder, Dr. Yaroslav Nikolaev, Dr. Aurelien Risk. From the Rockefeller University, Dr. Thomas P. Sakmar. From the University of New Mexico, Dr. Tudor Opria. Special thanks to Dr. Alexander Hauser for being such a wonderful co-host. For more information about the Ernest Network, please visit ernest-gpcr.eu. Would you like to sponsor us? Visit drgpcr.com slash sponsors or email us at hello at drgpcr.com. Did you know that you can also watch this panel discussion as well as GPCR podcasts on our YouTube channel? Subscribe today. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Alexander Hauser from the Early Career Committee team. I'm very excited to welcome you to this session where we're going to discuss machine learning and artificial intelligence in GPCR research. First, I would like to welcome Yamina Bechicha, alias Dr. GPCR, who is going to facilitate this roundtable discussion. And yeah, welcome back, Yamina, and um, here you go. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks so much uh, for, uh, for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here this morning, <clears throat> Boston time. It must be the afternoon for most of you in Europe. Um, so when I would like to first to initiate the discussion to start off with going around our speakers and have, asking them to introduce themselves so that we can set the stage for the, uh, for the conversation. Maria, please, uh, let's open up the, uh, the discussion with you. You are muted, Maria. Yeah, you're still muted, Maria. Okay, I have to unmute myself. Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Maria uh, Walter and I'm from Interx Biotech, a little Swiss startup company in uh, Switzerland. And uh, yeah, I, our company is focusing a little bit now on uh, machine learning algorithms to design novel GPCR compounds, but based on a really unique data set. And you heard Jaroslav's talk yesterday. He's also part of this meeting today. So I give the word on to Maria. Maria, before, before we give the word, can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Are you a machine learning uh, scientist or are you a pharmacologist? Okay, uh, I think, Amina, you know that I'm a trained zoologist, uh, scary enough, but I'm actually a pharmacologist by training and I worked for many years in academia um, and uh, then went to Big Pharma, worked at Novo Nordisk in uh, Denmark for about six and a half years in early R&D working really on the biology, uh, but there I got really interested in uh, the more um, mechanistic uh, translation from in vitro data to in vivo uh, effects of, of GPCR compounds. And, and you know, only with in vitro assays that, that didn't really do the trick. And there I got introduced to something called systems biology where people started describing um, signaling pathways with mathematical models. And then I started as a CSO in, in a small biotech in Switzerland, where I met Aurelien, uh, who's also one of his uh, co-hosts here, uh, who told me, oh, it's very easy to describe these uh, signaling pathways with mathematical models. And uh, for the past almost four years, uh, we now uh, work in Interax and have developed this to something that's still very fuzzy, but also very exciting. Thank you, Maria. Tom, let's, uh, let's continue with you. Well, thanks, uh, Yamina. First of all, um, I'd like to thank all the organizers for um, including me in this roundtable. I feel like a little bit like the uh, odd person out since I'm not um, directly experienced uh, with machine learning, but we're trying to incorporate um, these um, cutting edge technologies into our own work on drug discovery. Um, I'm probably the senior uh, <laughs> panelist here I've run a lab at Rockefeller University um, for about 30 years after um, clinical training um, in Boston and then postdoctoral training at MIT in the mid 80s where we started uh, cloning some of the first GPCRs and carrying out very early quantitative structure 
activity studies um, on GPCRs. Since then, we've been really interested in pushing the envelope on applying um, multidisciplinary innovative uh, assay technologies, including um, very early computational homology modeling um, of GPCRs based on um, even, even pre high resolution crystallography based on uh, um, very early um, imaging studies of GPCRs, including rhodopsin and disc membranes by uh, Henderson and Schertler and others. We then um, developed some early MD simulation strategies to look at uh, membrane proteins and GPCRs, and went on more recently to do coarse graining of complex systems uh, in collaboration with uh, Sievert, Jan Mernick, and we um, uh, were one of the first groups to do coarse graining of GPCRs uh, and bilayers. We also incorporate chemical techniques with the um, um, computational strategies so that we inform the computational methods um, by experiments. We often do experiments to develop hypotheses, which we uh, use to revise and uh, reform and um, you know, improve the computational methods. Some of the um, strategies we've used uh, on the chemical side have been facilitated by a technology called genetic code expansion which uses amber codon suppression to introduce unnatural amino acids into uh, site-specific locations into GPCRs, which then can be used as chemical handles or probes, for example, to uh, look with chemical precision at the effects of, uh, of um, chemical changes in, in the proteins. So basically, we um, try to be an entrepreneurial program uh, focused on GPCR drug discovery. And um, I'm really interested in uh, what this panel um, has to offer and what machine learning and AI has to offer for the future of drug discovery in this field. Thank you, Tom. Tudor, you're, uh, you're next. Thanks for being here this morning. Hi. I also want to thank the organizers, particularly Amina and Alex for giving me this opportunity to participate in the panel. I guess, uh, I've been practicing machine learning in one form or another since 1989, when uh, as a med student in Romania, I used BASIC to model the variation in uh, heart rate and blood pressure for 11 patients. I wrote an 11 polynomial that fit everything. So I thought I had solved the problem with drug discovery. I have learned a lot since. Uh, as far as GPCRs go, uh, I guess the uh, only success story that's uh, tacked under my belt is uh, GPR30 or G protein coupled estrogen receptor GPR. Uh, we described the first uh, agonist and antagonist uh, that modulate this uh, estrogen receptor. Uh, we use virtual screening to identify those and uh, the agonist known as G1 went into the clinic. So it's got an IND and uh, it's being uh, considered as a potential therapy for melanoma. Uh, this was licensed to Linnaeus Therapeutics. Uh, with respect to AI and machine learning, uh, we use uh, a lot of methods related to knowledge graph and uh, uh, XGBoost. So we use a, a method called Metapath where we a uh, couple, uh, lots and lots of data up to 53 different data sets that get stitched together. And uh, we don't specifically work on GPCRs, we are agnostic, but we try to impute new uh, functions for proteins with respect to phenotype and disease associations. And of course, we use the virtual screening as, as much as possible. Uh, other than that, uh, I'm an MD PhD by training, but I don't practice medicine. I do primarily research. Uh, I coordinate a project called Illuminating the Drugable Genome Knowledge Management Center, and um, I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much, Tudor. Aurelia, you're next on my screen. Hi, my name is uh, Aurelien Risk. So I'm the technology officer of uh, Interix Biotech. And uh, so I'm trained as a, a mathematician and computer scientist. I did my uh, PhD on um, developing new uh, methods to 
uh, develop and analyze um, models of signaling pathways of GPCRs. And um, then I went to Switzerland for, for a postdoc on studying um, uh, internalization and recycling of some GPCRs. And, since, and then um, uh, I um, worked in, at uh, Interex as a technology officer. And uh, so at Interex, as uh, Maria mentioned, we, we use systems biology to um, analyze experimental data and better characterize the effects of compounds on the signaling pathways. And while doing so, we generated a new uh, data set that we thought could, we, we realized that can be used as an input for machine learning methods to help guide the design of, um, of uh, novel lichens. Thank you so much, Aurelien. Uh, Yaroslav, I don't see you on my screen, but if you could uh, take over. Yes, I could show up here. I promise not to uh, overload the panel with Interax members. Uh, so my name is Yaroslav. I'm, uh, um, I have a dual uh, educational background in biology and computation. And then research-wise, I spend a lot of time in biomolecular NMR and structural biology. And then later during my postdoctoral uh, career, I was at the ETH, ETH Zurich doing systems biology for multiple years. And then I joined Interax and where I'm combining is trying to help combine the systems and structural biology. And in particular, also leverage the new methods of machine learning to help us uh, bring forward new ideas about how to apply uh, systems biology, structural biology to learn about GPCRs, how they work. Thank you so much, Yaroslav. Thank you all for, for the introductions. I think now we set the stage for, for starting out with the questions and I will start with the first one. I have a very naive, very basic question for our audience. What is AI and what is machine learning? If one of you can, uh, can talk to us more about these technologies that we can use and leverage to um, accelerate GPCR drug discovery. I'll let you. Um... All right, I'll take a pick. Okay, go ahead. Can you, can you guys hear me? Yes. So, because uh, I've given this a lot of thought, uh, AI uh, would be an application of machine learning and I'll start therefore with machine learning. Uh, Machine learning is uh, typically the application of uh, algorithms and uh, computer methods to try to identify patterns uh, in data. So in the early days, it used to be called uh, pattern recognition, then it became machine learning, and then later the buzzwords, you know, everything is now AI. Uh, the difference with AI is, so with machine learning, you have a state of data, you have an algorithm or a suite of algorithms and you run some models and you get some predictions. And so you learn something in the process, you apply it to your methods and you make some predictions. AI is slightly different. It's uh, intended to replace uh, human uh, brain function if you want. So think of uh, AI as a precursor. We had pocket calculators. So those of you who were around in the 1980s and uh, that would be a substitute of uh, brain function for mathematical operations. This has of course evolved. Uh, I have seven year olds who interact with uh, Alexa as if it were a person uh, and they, uh, so clearly AI is evolving. So that's the problem, machine learning. You have a set of data, you build a model. With AI, you have moving goalposts. In, 19, in the 1980s, I thought it was really cool to, to write software on BASIC. These days, uh, I'm not happy if uh, Alexa doesn't answer properly a question about, I don't know, uh, the American Revolution or something. So I hope that sets the stage. I'll let other people give a tack. Yes, maybe I, I, well, I agree with, uh, with this definition. So, so machine learning, I see it really as a, a set of tools to find the relationships between data sets. So we consider an uh, input data set and an output data set, and it will find the relationship between the two. And this is a training data. And then when we apply the same uh, the relationships which were found or the same functions which are found on the input data, then we can predict the output without having it. So this is machine learning. And then artificial intelligence is something broader, which, which is not really very well defined. It tries to, to mimic um, uh, human intelligence. And they, a good example is uh, indeed uh, a virtual assistant. So, so I know, I, I don't know if some of you know, but 
on uh, Emacs as a text editor on Linux. There, is a, there was a virtual psychotherapist there, which was developed, I think, in the 80s or 90s. And it's just a set of rules. So you, you, you could type, I'm not feeling well today. And it would answer, why, do, why, why are not you feel, feeling well? And it, it, just uh, responding on some keywords, just by a set of rules. But this is AI. You know? But it's not machine learning. You know? Thank you, thank you both for, for making that distinction because usually you read papers and you see AI slash machine learning, but it's not necessarily exactly the, the same thing. Um, now that we have established what the differences are between AI and machine learning, uh, let, let's come back to GPCRs. So we have 400 non-olfactory GPCRs, but 160 of them are currently being used as drug targets. There is much more to be done. Tom, Maria, can you, could you, uh, comment on, on some of the difficulties to better understand GPCR biology and to you know, accelerate drug discovery. And then um, obviously it's not just for Tom and Maria, but let's, let's start with, uh, with one of you. Okay, well, <clears throat> I'll comment um, on that question just based on the numbers that you um, uh, stated. So there are, there are many GPCR uh, targets um, where you have uh, specific uh, disease associated um, polymorphisms, for example, um, many genetic variants of unknown uh, significance that are associated with disease, but uh, haven't been uh, drugged, um, haven't been uh, even properly targeted in many pharmacological assays. And then there's the um, big, feature that many GPCRs are still technically orphans, which means that they, um, they're found in the genome, they're expressed usually in a tissue specific fashion. Um, they're, they're known to uh, be involved in, in signaling pathways, but the endogenous agonist has not been identified. So it's very hard to drug those targets. Many of those GPCRs um, are expressed in the CNS, even more interesting. And, and many of the orphan GPCRs are probably based on phylogenetic analysis um, receptors for encoded um, agonists, which are peptide ligands basically. And so how do we approach uh, these kinds of problems? I think there's opportunity there um, to merge data sets and develop data sets that are non-tabular in nature that are amenable to um, at least machine learning uh, strategies uh, for deorphanization and, uh, and drug targeting. If you include um, all of the genomic background information with the experimental information that's become available. So that's just one um, you know, very broad comment about the field. And, I'm curious about what Maria thinks, um, you know, coming from a more um, entrepreneurial side and a commercial side. Yeah, well, um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's very, you know, as always, we, we now think we found the holy grail by having machine learning and AI because we are, we are at the end of the story, right? The, the high throughput screens uh, have been, you know, ran at absurdum in the big in the big uh, pharma companies and uh, and that's the new thing to do uh, we often get to, to go back to the orphan the, the, the orphanization of receptors we often get asked oh is assistance biology can you work with orphan receptors and we said if we don't know how to activate it unless you make it red right um, we have no idea on how to analyze the signaling pathways so then we are we are stuck as anyone else i think that's that's a really in, in terms of drug design, you know, you, you can take Schrodinger. I've just talked to one of the representatives uh, today. Um, and they say, oh, we can do millions of, you know, virtual screens and using AI and doing all these things to actually get hits. And then my, my question is, but, but what do these hits mean? You know, do they actually exert a certain function, a signaling output that you want? Uh, there comes the whole bias uh, drama in again. It's like, how do you activate, how do you find a compound that actually has exactly that property to actually activate the pathway in that exact way? And I think we are only a small company doing something crazy uh, with systems biology to try to figure that out. Many people work with, uh, with biased you know, panels and stuff like that. I think it is a 
great start uh, to, to actually activate receptors um, and design compounds that have certain properties. Um, and I think we are very much in the beginning on this and machine learning, not AI, you have to use real intelligence. Data sets that feed into this can really help. So, yeah. Thank you, Maria, um, for this. I had one question come in. I sent out earlier this week a, a little survey on Twitter to uh, capture some of the questions that people may have. And I think this is the right time to ask the question that I received. So it goes uh, like this. Many existing databases were not generated for AI or machine learning purposes. What should researchers consider when establishing new data collection slash databases with regard to applicability in machine learning? Describe them well, right? Say how you really ran your assays, what assay buffers you used, what temperature you ran it in, what time points did you use to uh, do that, especially for signaling um, uh, things, because it's a huge mess. Did you co-express something to get your Emacs that you want? I mean, it's it's such a mess, right? If you want to analyze that, so I think if you if the real mathematicians here can figure out algorithms to weed out the messy data, that would be a good start. I don't know if that's possible. Yes, so, so, yeah. so the messy data is one point, but it's when there is missing information, then there is nothing which can be done. So it's really important to have as much information as possible there, and then there is a chance to do something. Yeah. So um. <clears throat> And I think, and you, for example, when, when you're doing virtual screening or, or this type of ligand screening of the sorts on, on a specific GPCR or set of GPCRs, do you require having a structure associated with it? And, and how, how do you go about trying to discover novel, novel ligands or you know, getting, getting better ligands to, for example, a, 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 put a GPCR? Aurelien, uh, Yaroslav, you're muted. So, so the question is how to design new... For example, you, you, you would like to discover novel ligands to a GPCR in the context of some disease, and you want that ligand to, to be more efficacious to, for example, I, I could think of, of a ligand to be biased, for example. What kind of data input do you need to, to obtain candidates that you can later test in the lab. Yeah. So, well, there can be different set of, of uh, input data set used for, for the learning. So for instance, if there are uh, known uh, ligands for, for the target, this can, this can be used. And uh, uh, um, machine learning uh, technique can be trained just on the known ligands. Then if there is uh, information on the structure of the receptor, this can be used as well. So, I don't think there is a definite um, answer there <laughs> on, on what is required. No. No. Thank you. Um, there, there I'll, I'll take a crack as well. Oh, of course. I think that the difficult part or the trick is to find uh, a rigid ligand. So uh, anything that would give you a hook into your target. So uh, think of each small molecule that you test your receptor as, I mean, they are called probes, but they're called probes for a reason. And basically you're probing the receptor to figure out the binding site. So you're literally asking a question and then uh, you toss the chemical at the receptor, you get an answer. So the experiment is the answer. So any information that you have about the receptor that you can use to bias your initial selection for uh, virtual screening and then later uh, to select a library for a physical screening, uh, you should use that. And if possible, give preference to rigid ligands because you eliminate the conformational bias. That's always a problem. And uh, that might take you faster to a result. And uh, it's important to think about it this way. Uh, it doesn't really matter that the computation is perfect. What really matters is that you get results quickly because even negative results provide information and uh, you would then run your next iteration. And uh, if you know you took a road that was a wrong turn, you just move in the opposite direction and eventually you'll find something, so. Thank you, Tudor. Uh, I have a question from the audience. Uh, what would you guys suggest to the small academic labs in terms of going forward? 
what is the best way we can incorporate AI and machine learning into our own research? Can they be more precise with what's a small academic lab? Exactly. <laughs> Are we talking I, I, five people with a computer or are we talking uh, five people with an uh, experimental bench in the computer? It could be both. It could be both. Yeah, I think a small academic lab is, is probably five people with a bench and a computer. Um, yeah. it's, um, it, it, is, it is possible to do interesting work. Um, that maybe, maybe AI is a bit of a stretch unless you are in an environment that uh, has a lot of um, you know, computer science uh, infrastructure. Um, but certainly machine learning um, algorithms um, are available, uh, you know, and open, open source things are available. And it is possible to do, to do um, a virtual screening um, in, in small groups. I think the most important thing actually is to have the capability of, um, we've been talking about it, of critical evaluation of existing data sets, and then to be able to um, develop or at least um, interrogate assays you know, at, at the bench. I think most GPCR labs have the ability to do at least one or two assays um, at an expert level on the um, receptor or class of receptors that they're most interested in. And so if you, if you have a class of receptors that you're most interested in, um, and a small academic group, you can focus on the signaling pathways that are relevant. Say, uh, say if it's a GQ linked receptor, you can focus on um, I, um, IP pathways, um, beta arrestin recruitment assays, which are relatively easy to set up. So you can, you can do the, you know, the key assays for your receptor in the uh, background of uh, existing data sets. And you can essentially create, um, create uh, robust uh, learning sets uh, yourself uh, that, that exist in the context of existing information about that receptor. So I think if, if you're created, uh, creative and, um, and uh, communicate with others in the field, uh, I, th I think the advantage of an academic group is that there are so many computer scientists out there and so many computational groups that are absolutely um, desperate to have experimental collaborators <laughs> that uh, if, if you find uh, you know, the right people who you, you can communicate with, it's very fruitful uh, in, in academic uh, groups. That's been our experience. I think uh, in our lab, um, We've always tried to be um, multidisciplinary within the group, but we would reach out for um, expert help um, on the computational side. And uh, we've always had um, you know, fruitful collaborations with, uh, with good groups um, on the computational side. So the advice to small groups, and you know, I think groups, groups starting out is to um, reach out to people um, and offer help with um, sort of critical evaluation of uh, data sets and uh, assay strategies. Thank you, Tom. Maria, you wanted to, to add something to it? No, I, I totally agree with Tom uh, on this. It's, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 in our little biotech, we combine, you know, both sides, we're a small lab, like wet lab, and then we are a bunch of computer scientists, it's really half half. Um, and just the, the computing time and, and amount that you would need to do things and to set this all up is, is enormous. And you actually, I, I completely underestimate how much, you know, we are actually done in the wet lab with our signaling assays. And then we tell the computer scientists, no, this is you, can you analyze it? And it takes weeks. Um, not because they can't do it, but because it's also computation and then overnight you run a fit and then the server crashes and all this kind of stuff. So I think if you collaborate with someone who actually is an expert and has cloud access and has all these kind of things set up and these big computing machines, you're really well off. And I agree with Tom, 
generate really amazingly good data that can be reproduced um, and that are well controlled and 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 kept. You know, not I transpect here, I transpect there. I think that's really important. Uh, and then it's it's really super beneficial. I think uh, if these two worlds work together. And, and actually Jaroslav said something to me earlier today. He said, I think what's really important is not to only have the computational people make a virtual screen and say, now this is gonna work, but actually bring in the biologists as well and vice versa and talk to each other um, and, and look at the data together. Uh, you know, trust that some people that, that know about biology could also like look at your data sets and your fits and say, oh, it doesn't quite look okay. Um, so I think that's really important. Thank you, Maria. I have very limited experience working with machine learning and also working in the lab. And I think one, one of the take home messages I had from that experience is that, yes, we absolutely need to work together. In the lab, it's very important for us to generate very good, reliable, high quality, and ideally a lot of data because generating 56,000 56, data points for us in the lab is a great accomplishment. Giving that to, uh, to machine learning folks and computational folks is, is drop it in the bucket. But I think, I think it's very important to be able to work together and then uh, you know, get the right information out of it. And as, as Twitter had suggested or said earlier, thinking about iterations of all of these cycles is, is very important and um, beneficial in the long run. So I am looking at the chat at the same time. And um, maybe I can ask Alex to scroll up a little bit and uh, um, talk about some of the questions that came in. Uh, there is one question uh, that uh, says, are there examples of de-orphanization by AI? Alex, isn't that you guys? Uh, yes, yeah, I already answered in the chat that, um, yeah, we did indeed use a, a random forest machine learning classifier to, to learn from existing peptides to, to look for, for stretches in the human genome that could encode for peptides that eventually could uh, target some of the orphan receptors. And we did, indeed, indeed we did find uh, novel pairings through, through that method. Um, I, I'm sure there's, there's a lot more to it and uh, maybe um, you can only learn that much from existing peptides, uh, maybe the the remaining orphans are orphans because uh, they're so different from what's already existing. So maybe AI, uh, at least based on sort of that, uh, based on the known peptide ligands, wouldn't help very much. But of course, there's a lot more in human physiology and a lot more data that can be pulled and integrated to maybe uh, shed some lights on on, on new ligands um, for orphan receptors. And and maybe that's also a question to Tudor then, as he's uh, part of the IDG and also one of the creators of Pharos, which is a, a big uh, data integration uh, exercise and, and hub. How could, for instance, the GPCR field leverage the, the tremendous amounts of data that are in, in, in Pharos and other places to uh, maybe answer some questions that in, in the GPCR field? For instance, um, selectivity, but of course we talked a bit already about um, uh, drug discovery, but maybe there, there are also other questions that can be solved by, by data um, that are maybe more sort of uh, new in the sense because back then we didn't have the means to to answer them so there's like new questions that are that are also possible to ask so i'll i'll try to take a a, a crack at your uh, question about how to use uh, pharos uh, um, so first I should point out as I did in the chat that uh, uh, all the data in Pharos is now in machine learning ready format. And uh, if you go to the database dump, uh, you should be able to plug and play. Uh, we also have source code on GitHub, uh, which allows you to run uh, Python and R versions of uh, Metapath combined with XGBoost and, and taking uh, the ingesting. Uh, so we have an adapter for uh, the TCRD, which is the database behind Pharos. Uh, as to specifically for GPCRs, uh, I tried to combine data from uh, in Pharos to, to, to use GPCRs as input, uh, particularly those that were related to 
sympathomimetic pathway. So things like adrenergic receptors and uh, dopaminic uh, uh, stuff like that. And uh, I tried to figure out the question, are we missing something? Uh, are there any hidden receptors in the orphan world? And uh, the results were like a mixed bag. Uh, uh, it did show up with uh, something like the trace amine uh, receptor one, which uh, uh, some of you might know it's a uh, legit GPCR, uh, but then it also found all the other trace amine receptors, which at least current experimental data suggests they're not really uh, involved in sympathomimetic responses. So uh, I guess the difficult part is you, you try uh, machine learning and uh, if you get some result, always question it, don't trust it. Uh, and also talk to experts. Uh, so I guess I should give the output of that uh, computer model to, to you, Alex, to, to figure out if it's any useful or not. Thank you, Tudor. Uh, there's another question uh, in the chat. I think we a little bit uh, talked about it, but the question is, is the potential of AI limited to well-studied classical GPCRs or it can be also used for understudied GPCRs? you have anything to add to add to this? Well, so as part of the IDG program, our mission is to look at understudy GPCRs. And uh, I'd say definitely we use uh, these methods for understudy GPCRs. I think uh, you, you take the knowledge that the, the lessons learned from well-studied GPCRs, and then you try to deploy similar uh, algorithms and methods on, on the understudied ones. And, uh, I think there is uh, enough evidence that uh, at least for some receptors like GPR68, uh, uh, GPR65, there's a number that are coming out of the uh, Roth and Shoiket lab that uh, show the, the power of these methods for receptors that we pretty much didn't know anything about. And then suddenly uh, the field is wide open and uh, you get lots of papers in nature and stuff like that. Thank you for that. Um, so we've talked about machine learning and what it can bring to, to the GPCR field. Um, if it, I'm looking for examples of specific applications of machine learning to better understand GPCR biology and, and different, for example, ligand binding, but also structure function relationships and, and signaling. Maria, we, we've talked during our podcast episode but that we recorded here in my, in my closet last time that uh, you've been very interested in what happens when the receptor gets activated and over time how how that signaling cascade um, responds to, to ligands over time. Can you comment a little bit about the, the, um, the use of machine learning to better understand specific um, aspects of GPCR signaling? It's a tricky question, I think, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we just do it with, with a little way around. We first use real intelligence, not the artificial one to try and understand what's going on. That's what we've all done for the past many, many, many years. Um, and now we try mathematics to, to describe it. And that's an input, that's data input that we give there. We feed uh, already the algorithms with these kind of information. And I think the more we feed it, uh, the, the more we will learn. And, and you know, I, I think we had, I have one example when I, when I still work in, in Big Pharma, where one of my computational team told me, oh, this receptor is not using a resin to internalize. There has to be an arrest in independent thing there. And I'm like, that's rubbish. We never picked it up. Complete rubbish. Um, and uh, that was before the CRISPR cell lines came out, the arrested knockout CRISPR cell lines. Um, and then a year later or so, I, I get a call from a, from a colleague who uh, said, oh, you know, we've tested this compound as a negative control because we thought it doesn't need a resin. Uh, to internalize and now we put it in this CRISPR knockout cell and then poohoo, it does do that. So he actually a year later proved what we, what I got predicted. And, uh, and so I think you can learn also about biology by, by starting to, to use this kind of technologies. That's what excites me really about, about doing that and start trusting these mathematicians and machine learning people a little bit more and people who know me uh, when all these structures came out, I'm like, ah, oh, you know, with structure, what do you want to do with structure? You, can, you, you need to learn about the biology, right? But now everything seems to come together, right? So you need the structure in order to, 
to create compounds that then tickle it in a way that then, you know, kicks out the signal that you want. So yeah, that's my comment on that. Thank you, Maria. Chris de Graaf has some, uh, has some really good comments here where he talks about uh, some advanced uh, methods such as recurrent neural networks or deep generative models. And maybe uh, Yaroslav and, and Arlien, maybe you could comment a little bit on what type of methods you are actually using to make use of the data that is being generated in the systems biology approach from, from Interax. Like for instance, I would be interested in whether you've used some of these uh, deep generative models or um, variational autoencoders or GANs and, and these kind of methods that came up in the recent years. Yeah, maybe you can comment on this. So um, we did not use uh, generative uh, approaches. So we focused really on, at first on a, on a specific given task, uh, which is uh, given a computational chemistry data set and a signaling data set, what is the relationship between, between the two to try to learn what are the features or of the inter ligand interaction with a receptor which are driving the, um, the signaling. But then um, I think what is uh, interesting with these uh, approaches, with the generative approaches, is that, so they generate lots of ligands and then, then they need uh, scoring functions or other programs to evaluate the compounds which are generated. And there, many scoring functions can be combined. Yeah. And what we do could be one of the scoring function there. So I can just give some examples. So one scoring function can be, uh, is this ligand binding uh, the receptor? Is this ligand, uh, do, does it have good um, pharmacokinetic properties? Can it be synthesized? And each one of these tasks can be um, a software which is trained with experimental data and done with machine learning. And then what, what we do and what Yaroslav proposed, presented yesterday is, um, is another scoring function, an additional one to score the hits based on their signaling uh, properties. Yeah. Yeah. I hope this <laughs> gives an overview on this. Yeah, we saw in the talk yesterday from, uh, from Yaroslav that you're using uh, simulations as, as one input for sort of way to generate uh, a data set that is then linked to the, the signaling profiles. Um, maybe uh, you can elaborate a little bit on how you uh, aggregate the data that you generate in your simulations to feed as an input to, to, to any model, like, uh, like to which features are you actually selecting? Or are you just leaving it very raw and, and, and hope that, uh, you know, patterns are picked up? And maybe I can comment on this uh, and I will follow up a little bit on what Aurelien was saying now uh, about the types of models. So the thing is that we have a relatively small data set. So I should, we have about uh, two, three dozens of agonists at the moment. We're doing more, but still it's relatively limited. And so to uh, that's why we are building up very gradually starting from sort of shallow learning algorithms, not going to very complicated models like uh, generative stuff and recurrent networks and so on. So just to build confidence that the things that we are looking at, they're really there and that we are not overfitting things and so on. And now uh, commenting on what you say, so with these molecular dynamics data sets that we have, it's, uh, it's, it's a similar thing there. So we, we have to initially look at the structures and try to propose for algorithms things uh, which uh, sort of in the knowledge of a structural biologist makes sense, uh, interactions, distances, maybe water molecules, position of helices, and then we combine long lists of uh, different features and we'll try to kind of learn which ones of them are actually correlated with the biology that we observe. And in the ideal case, of course, we could just dump the whole uh, molecular dynamic uh, simulated 3D structure into like convolutional network, which can kind of separate it by pixels and then try to learn a bit of structural biology like uh, bonds, residues, and so forth, and then tell us what is uh, correlated with the biology. But uh, we first have to build confidence, and then we also have to build the data sets. And th this is one of the things that, uh, in my uh, impression, is that it's one of the um, bottlenecks, indeed, and like uh, what uh, uh, I guess Chris uh, de Graaf would know better in the, the, the structural work they do on GPCRs in SOSE. Uh, they probably have a lot more data than anybody in the world. But really the availability of structures per se, static structures of GPCRs 
that's uh, one of the big bottlenecks. And the other bottleneck is the computational resources required to do molecular dynamic simulations on these structures, because a static structure of GPCR doesn't tell as much as a dynamic one. And it takes a lot of resources to calculate that. So in a way, uh, these two bottlenecks, they're really challenging. So they're much more challenging, I think, than you know, figuring out right algorithms to apply to, to the data. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, that's why it's very important to, to not just um, hand over just a big lump of data to, uh, you know, a machine learning a data scientists. I mean, we, we also saw from the introduction that most, most of us are actually coming from a biological background, because I think we realize it's not just uh, feeding in some, some, some table into some sort of algorithm, and then, you know, it, it spits out the answer. It's, it's actually going hand in hand with the interpretation of the, of the data and where it comes uh, very important to know actually how the data was generated, right? Um, yeah, so uh, do we, we have... I think we have another question in the chat box. Uh, do you think that there is one or a couple of machine learning techniques that are more used or preferred for GPCR research? If so, which ones? Anyone? can take a quick bite on that. I mean, in, in any, not only GPCRs, there is no general machine learning or artificial intelligence technique that is best suited. So, I mean, you have to look at the what type of data you have and and so forth. And uh, yeah, you have to get a little bit of a feeling what different techniques can do with what type of data. And so there is no uh, free lunch, so to say. And um, when it comes to, to the type of data that you input, uh, is it better to have um, when you look at signaling data, for example, let's say you have a crystal structure or cryo-EM structure of a target receptor, um, you know, it binds molecules or it binds a peptide and you have the active confirmation um, of the cryo-EM the cryo structure of an active confirmation, and then you generate um, pharmacology, molecular pharmacology data in the lab. Is it better to have, getting back to the kinetic thing, is it better to have kinetic data on multiple ligands, for example, uh, with dose responses, or is it better to have an endpoint um, endpoint response to multiple ligands when it comes to, to the data from the lab? I would guess, depending on what you say, multiple, I would guess both would be valuable at some point. But if you're starting with just a handful of ligands, like two, three, four, five, then definitely kinetic traces. And then maybe around a couple of a dozen, then it would be good to sample chemical space and then once you sample chemical space, you may be getting again, looking at the kinetic data again. And, uh, but one of the things is that unfortunately, as I, I don't know, maybe uh, Tudor and uh, Thomas can correct me. Unfortunately, this uh, cryo-EM revolution, which is seemed to be happening, it's, it's not really applied to GPCR so well because the resolution of the structures are not as high as would be needed to really see the differences in the dynamic confirmations of GPCRs. But maybe I'm a little bit off here. And... Thank you. I, I would like to ask another question uh, from uh, Maurizio, uh, which I like. Uh, he says, uh, has the, well, he asked, has the human component of chemical intuition changed much pre-AI or deep learning uh, and post? As uh, Tudor, you also, uh, pointed out that, I mean, these um, deep uh, uh, ultra, ultra large uh, docking campaigns from, from Brian Choikit and others, there is always a, this component of like picking or this hit picking party where uh, you, you follow the scoring function to, to some extent, but in the end, then you, you follow your intuition and, and you select uh, among the top red scored um, hits. Do you think that we're we going to see more and more, we're going to go more and more away from this and that AI potentially can pick up this experience and intuition uh, scientists have after, after many years? So I, I had uh, the privilege or the chance to meet uh, really experienced uh, pharmacologists and, and medicinal chemists. Uh, and uh, I can say that uh, I don't think anything would match that type of expertise uh, when it comes to spotting ligands. So uh, 
like uh, Dan Rich who worked on HIV protease inhibitors, he would look at the 2D structure and basically mentally do a docking and tell you whether that's a good protease inhibitor or not. I think there are people who have worked in the GPCR field that can do a similar exercise. Uh, and that's probably why we have these uh, hit picking parties. Uh, is it possible in the future that we will learn enough to divest this particular uh, task to computers? Yes, it's possible. But by then we will probably have learned a lot more than what we currently know. So uh, I wouldn't, say that in the next five to 10 years, uh, computers will completely replace uh, humans when it comes to this, but um, we might approach that uh, point where the hybrid uh, model is, is more likely to happen. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, Tudor. We have another question from Maria in the chat box. How much of a problem is the lack of true negatives in your models? Would you have any suggestions on how to sort that out, maybe for experimental work? True negatives. Lack of true negatives is a really big, big problem. Uh, we, uh, we tried to build, say, for example, models for Alzheimer's, and uh, we started with uh, a lot of genes that were uh, clearly giving us uh, the positives, but when it comes to negatives, we couldn't move past that. And uh, I had this interesting experience with uh, autophagy. So I, I built a model for looking for autophagy dark genes. And uh, uh, once I replaced the inferred negatives, so I used by default uh, omim uh, genes as negatives. And the assumption there is that uh, whatever gene set is present in omim, these are monogenic uh, disease associations. So you think that if they're associated with this particular phenotype or disease, they're probably less likely to be associated with the phenotype you're looking for. Obviously not the same as the ones in OMIM. Uh, turns out that, uh, so I, I came across a CRISPR paper that uh, identified a specific uh, gene, but then it also had uh, five different experiments with lots of supplementary material. So once you get to the bottom of that CRISPR and you find uh, uh, genes that are totally inactive, use those as true negative, the model changes radically and it gives you a much better picture. So having true negatives is really important. Uh, uh, finding ways to incorporate true negatives in your machine learning will definitely improve the model. I have one more question. Um, like now with the advent of AI and, and, and deep learning and so forth, we see a lot of applications and it's almost becoming like a running gag. Ah, oh, you're, you're, you're writing AI and or deep learning in your application. So maybe you could comment a little bit how much you think it's actually uh, a hype and uh, people just uh, call AI machine learning data analysis and what they've done in the past anyways. Or is this truly um, the sort of future also for for people who are who are doing uh, experiments in in the lab or i mean is their daily life going to change very much i think i i found a very recent funny I, I don't know if it's directly related to this but roger penrose who just won the nobel prize in physics right he works on you know consciousness and also on using artificial intelligence and, and he he gave a recent podcast and, and, and he, you know, the question was, uh, or the, the, the idea was, if you only make, generate big enough numbers, big enough networks, big enough algorithms, suddenly intelligence pops out on the other side. And he was asked what he thinks about it. And he said, well, it's simply because they cannot think of anything else to do yet, right? So <laughs> it's the big hope that this will alleviate us from our, quest for for you know finding things out and and i like what tudor said i think the hybrid of doing you know our intuition uh of, of what makes us scientists by heart and combine it with with what these these things can help us i, I think then we're on the on the right path and it's you know bias agonism was a hype or still is a hype before it was called functional selectivity um uh, it's it's you know it's just names I think it's it's we, it makes our work easier the more we learn about all these kind of things but 
um, hypes are good, they are fun, but uh, you know, the passion for what we do and then doing real biology and trying all means to get to the point where we can in the end help, help people, even with COVID. Um, that's, that's, I think, what's important. That's, that's my final message. <laughs> Someone else in the hype? Or? I think not. Um, we have five minutes left uh, of the, for, the, for this panel. I wanted to go around and, uh, well, first of all, thank you all for, for being here today. Um, we've talked through, throughout this past 50 plus minutes about the importance of, of having the right model, having the right um, machine learning tools to analyze a lot of data that gets get generated in the lab. And we really want very robust, detailed data. Maria, you had mentioned that you really wanted to, to make sure that you documented the buffer, the content of the buffer, and everything that, that's being done. Uh, maybe one of you or you could comment on where do you see the field uh, in, in the next five years. So the way I see it is hand in hand, experimental data with the, with the machine learning, with the computational power that, that um, we can bring to the field. Where do you see the field in, in the next five years? Did you ask me? No, just anyone. Muted myself. Anyone who would like to uh, give. It's going to be very exciting, to be honest. I think we are just at the beginning. I don't know how it with you guys, but uh, I think it's going to be super. Like when the first, uh, you know, crystal structure came out, it was like, wow. And then pop, 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 pop. And now we're like, hey, yeah, another one. And I think now we will learn so much more about the, the interplay of, of all these uh, disciplines, to be honest. We are moving much, much closer. Um, and try to try to figure things out. And I personally find it a super exciting time to be a young scientist, right? I'm getting old, but 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 for the people that are just starting now, I think it's super exciting to to be in this field right now. I think so. Um, sorry. So um, yeah, the future will really be this combination. So to me, well, I, I think. It, AI will bring a lot of new things or a lot of new knowledge because it is able it is able to analyze big quantities of data and it will learn new things that cannot be done by a human. And this in combination with the human knowledge and experience, this will be really powerful, has a lot of potential. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. I would say the future is um, uh, what's probably going to take off and I'm hoping it will in the next uh, five to ten years so I, I get to see part of it is uh, olfactory GPCRs. Uh, I know a lot of people have stayed away from them but uh, I think there's uh, literally a, a gold mine when it comes to uh, perfume industry and uh, therapeutic applications. Uh, they've literally been understudied and pretty much ignored uh, and uh, soon enough, somebody will figure out that experimental method to bring these uh, uh, receptors in, in line for, for in vitro screening, because I, I think that was the problem until now. So hopefully that will happen. Uh, the other thing that uh, people should keep in mind, uh, and I've done this analysis, it's published in Nature Drug Discovery, uh, GPCRs are a trillion dollar market when it comes to drugs. So we looked at uh, uh, drug sales worldwide data for 75 countries and uh, it was 0.9 trillion dollars uh, looking at GPCR ligands. It's not going to go away soon. So uh, I would say if you want to work on GPCRs and finding new drugs, uh, just go for it. Uh, it's worth it. Thank you. Anyone, any final words? We have one minute left before we, we close the, uh, the discussion. All right, five, four, three, two, one. If no one has anything to say, thank you again to all our panelists for being here today. Thank you for the audience. Fantastic questions, great discussion. And uh, hopefully we can, we can do this next year and, and bring more to the table and uh, talk more about the advances uh, that, that we're making in the field. Thank you, everyone. Alex, any thank final? You, no, thank you, Yamina. It was great. Thank you so much. Alex, Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.
Thank you for listening to this wonderful Dr. GPCR podcast episode. Thank you again to the Ernest Network for the opportunity to chair this session. Mark your calendars. I will be giving a flash presentation about Dr. GPCR at the 9th GDR meeting held between November 6th and 9th, 2020. If you haven't registered yet, now is the time to do so by visiting gdr3545.com. Don't miss out to hear more about GPCRs from physiology to drugs. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Dr. Alexander Hauser for co-chairing the session. Thanks also to Attila Forrest. Music by Rosa Bershish. I'm your host, Dr. Yamina Bershish. Until next time, stay safe.